Okay. Um, while still people are joining, I want to clear up one of the questions that was left open in the last session. And that was about the formula for the within chain variance and the between chain variance. So let me just briefly uh, bring that up again. Okay, um, so we had these formulas and the question was whether this text was wrong. I changed it here now. Uh, or whether the code was wrong. And the code was correct, but the description was not quite right. So W is the average of the within chain variances. <clears throat> so you compute the variance within each chain. So you have a variance within chain one, variance within chain two, and so forth. And then you average those. And that's what the code did. It was just written here incorrectly. Okay, um, so what we did in the morning session was to get to know Markov Chain Monte Carlo uh, in one of the more basic incarnations, and we observed how it behaves, um, how we can tell that something's wrong, um, and uh, and what what it produces. That it produces these probability distributions for us if things go well. And uh, now we will talk about a more advanced version of this Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithm called Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. And you will be working with Francesca here. She will tell you all about it. And it is in this notebook number five, uh, Hamiltonian MC. So I will let Francesca take over now and take it away. Thank you very much. Yes, so hello everybody. Please give me a little moment to share my screen. Hopefully now you should be seeing the notebook. Okay, and I'll just open up the participants and chat as well. So how this is going to work, this uh, material I've put here in a notebook, mainly because everything we've worked with so far is in a notebook uh, and it's easier, but also because there'll be a small bit of coding at the end where I really just want to demonstrate some of the things that I talk about. Uh, I haven't foreseen tutorial session today on this, mainly because we'll be working with Hamiltonian Monte Carlo and in particular the package I'll introduce uh, all throughout next week. So there will be plenty of opportunity to look more deeply at this. Uh, but I do want to show a few things. So I'll mostly just go through the, the text in this notebook, uh, but feel free to also open it up and follow along. Uh, I just got a little message. Participants can see your app. I don't know what that means. Is it working all right? You can see? Yes. Good. <laughs> Very nice. And yes, it's this material is a little bit difficult. Uh, as Johannes said, this is kind of an advanced implementation of Markov Chain Monte Carlo. So I will pause frequently for questions, but also feel free to raise your hand or write or interrupt uh, at any time. And I'll do my best to keep an eye on all the different media. All right. So Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. As you've probably noticed during the last session and uh, playing with the code that was introduced, uh, the MCMC samplers, and in particular that random walk metropolis algorithm that you implemented, is kind of just a guided random walk throughout uh, the parameter space guided by the target distribution that you provide. So I think a nice analogy of this, uh, at least when I like to think about, it's kind of like a drunk person trying to climb a mountain that, okay, you know where you got to go based on this information that you have about the target distribution, 
but there's definitely a, a level of randomness to it. And this randomness is actually what makes things uh, inherently inefficient, right? If you uh, maybe saw in your exercises that sometimes if you have too small a proposal, you can just end up kind of diffusing around a small area, not doing anything interesting. And if it's too big, you can basically be so inefficient as to be in the same uh, regime as rejection sampling. Uh, so while we can do some more fancy stuff with the Metropolis algorithm and think about also reparameterizing re models in ways that this can become more efficient. Uh, this inefficiency, because of the diffusive nature of the algorithm, will always be there. Uh, and this will become especially important in high dimensions. So what I mean here when I say high dimensions are problems with many free parameters, because then you imagine this parameter space is expanding in dimensionality. So the algorithm I will now introduce called Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, also sometimes called hybrid Monte Carlo, uh, is a much more efficient way to do uh, this kind of MCMC. So to draw samples from the target posterior. And the reason that it is much more efficient is mainly due to this departure from the random walk approach. So as we'll see, instead, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo will use concepts from Hamiltonian mechanics to direct our transitions and avoid diffusive behavior. So I'm always happy to talk about Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. It's my favorite algorithm, uh, partly because of this efficiency. That means you can work with much more complex problems. Uh, but also, I just think it's it's a very cool idea, especially coming from a physics perspective, which I'm sure most of you are. So all of my material that I will introduce here is largely based on this really nice paper that's linked uh, by Michael ba Michael Battenport. And this paper is all about introducing the concepts behind Hamiltonian Monte Carlo without going into too much of the mathematical background. Uh, so yeah, this paper is great, but it's also quite heavy. It's some 60 pages. So what I'll try to do here is really condense it down into the key points. And of course, you can go there. This is the obvious further reading for this part. So before I really jump into what Hamiltonian Monte Carlo is, I just want to take a little step back and review something that we already talked about uh, regarding Markov chain Monte Carlo in general. So what are we really trying to do with Markov chain Monte Carlo? We generally think, I think at least when I ask people this or what I see when people explain their MCMC algorithm in research papers, the usual phrase is that we're exploring the posterior distribution or the target distribution. And yes, this is kind of true. You can think of your little walkers and chains a bit like hikers exploring a mountain range and mapping it out. Uh, the statement is also pretty vague. I mean, what does it really mean to explore the distribution? What are we really trying to do? Oh, sorry about that. Um, so to actually quantify this, it's important to remember that our goal here is eventually to compute expectation values on these distributions of our parameters of interest. And so, okay, let's remind what is an expectation value. And uh, we can think of, uh, so first I'll, I'll introduce a little bit of notation and here I use exactly the notation as in um, the paper that I'm working with. So it might be a little bit different to what we've had in the lecture so far, but shouldn't be too difficult to follow along. Uh, so if we imagine that we are in a target sample space Q of which any point, little Q, 
can be parameterized by real numbers. So we're just in a continuous space in D dimensions. So this Q can be multidimensional. And in this parameter space, we can let our target distribution be some smooth density function that I'll call pi of Q. And if we want to compute expectation values here, we want to compute things like the mean of the distribution or the width of the distribution or any of these familiar quantities. And in general, characterize its shape. And so we can write this more generally as shown in this expression here, where the expectation value of any function f is just the integral over q, the parameter space uh, of the target distribution multiplied by this distribution or the function that we want to compute the expectation for. So you're probably more used to in your standard introductory statistic classes, seeing expressions like the expectation value of x is the integral of x times by the distribution of x, and then very similar for the variance just with x squared. So this is really just a generalization of that to any function, because we don't, we might not know a priori what particular expectation value we want to compute. And what we're doing with our Markov chains in the end is approximating this integral, because this integral is difficult to do, especially in high dimensions, and when we don't have closed form analytic expressions for these distributions. So if we start to think about this as being our goal, we can reflect on, okay, what's the most efficient way to compute this integral? And already we can see that we don't want to spend time evaluating or sampling where the value of this integral is vanishingly small, so where we won't have any contribution. And uh, with this in mind, uh, we can see, okay, we have two contributing factors in this integral. We have pi of q, which is our target distribution, and we have f of q, which is this general function we might want to compute the expectation of. Uh, in principle, we don't know what f of q is. We might want it to be multiple things. So let's leave that to one side for now. But we can see, okay, we don't want to waste time evaluating the, uh, the target distribution in regions of parameter space that have negligible contributions, so at close to zero. And this is completely intuitive. I think everybody has probably realized that uh, already in these examples. So you think, great, this integral problem can be really simplified. We just focus on regions with large density, large target distribution density. And it's not exactly this simple. Uh, so as we just seen, the expectation is really an integral of this density over the volume dq, which we pretty much forgot about in the previous discussion. So while the density will of course be large at the mode or the maximum of the distribution, uh, there's actually very little volume here relative to the rest of space. So this is something that's maybe okay to visualize in two dimensions, but it actually becomes increasingly bad as we move to higher and higher dimensions. So I think we already discussed before in Johannes' lectures, the curse of dimensionality, but I just want to reiterate uh, going through this little figure here. So if we imagine that we just partition our space with equally sized intervals in different dimensions, we can start, uh, yeah, and, and then consider we have a point of interest in each of these partitions. So let's say it's the mode of the distribution or something like that. And then we can see that here, 
uh, in one dimension, this integral of interest will have like relative importance of one third in terms of the volume. And if we go to two dimension, we're already reduced now to like a fraction of one ninth. And then again to three dimensions, now the fraction of the volume that's around our area of interest is just 127. And there's actually a lot more volume everywhere else, relatively. So really the largest amount of volume is going to end up in the tails of the distribution away from the mode. And I think this is something that's not always intuitive. So we can visualize this now with a nice plot here that I pinched from the paper I was referring to. If we consider uh, the x-axis as being our distance from the mode, so q minus q mode, so just think of it as the distance from the distribution maximum. And here is our plotted here target density as pi of q. Uh, we see, yes, okay, as we go away from its maximum, it will decrease. But also, we have to remember that the volume dq is going to be increasing. And in fact, it's going to do this really quickly all the way up here. So actually, what becomes important in this integral, let me just jump back there. If we consider that we have dq multiplied by pi q, is this region kind of in between the two? Whoop. And this shape, whoop, you will see, has its maximum somewhere between the maximum of the distribution and the tails of the distribution. So this is really where we want to focus our energy if we want to compute expectation values. And so all of our efforts, which we will see with Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, will be in how can we get our sampler to spend time in this region, which I will now refer to as the typical set. And the typical set is where we have the maximum contribution to our expectation values. And so it's the most interesting place for our sample to spend time. So, okay, we understand this. But now, as we discussed before, standard Markov chain Monte Carlo it, algorithms such as the Metropolis Hastings uh, will eventually explore this typical set through the diffusive behavior. As long as we have a Markov transition that preserves the target distribution. And what this means is just that we have a transition that is such that if we, for example, took our chain of samples from a converged Markov chain, uh, Markov chain, and we took all these samples, and they will have they will represent some distribution. And then, if we apply this transition to that, we should see that we actually recover the same distribution, even though the individual targets will have uh, individual samples will have moved around. That's all that means. We can't have any transition kernel that has to preserve the target distribution, which is definitely true of the Gaussian kernel we were using before. And then, as we saw before, given sufficient time, the samples from our Markov chain will actually approximate our desired expectations. So you can see here this little formula. You can think of this as an example if we want to have a, an approximation of the mean, we would simply find the mean of our converged uh, chain of samples. And then in the limit of infinite sample numbers, 
this estimate will actually equal the expectation value that we set out to compute. So we've managed to approximate that interval. So that's all I wanted to recall so far uh, from what we've been doing on MCMC in general. So I'll pause here a little moment in case there are any questions before I go on with the Hamiltonian part. All right. Um, I have a question. Oh, hello. Um, You're a little... uh, oh, there you go. Yeah. I have a question. So um, how would you exactly prove that uh, a Markov transition preserves the target distribution? Good question. Uh, I do not have the mathematical proof in front of me. Um, so I think the short answer is I don't know. <laughs> But uh, in principle, you want your transition to be reversible. And this is kind of what we saw with the Gaussian, right? That it can, it doesn't matter which direction you go in. Uh, the probability, or no, the, the proposal probability is equal in all directions. But yeah, I don't have a good answer for you there. I'm sorry. I don't know if Johannes has any comment. I, I think I would have said pretty much the same thing. So detailed balance is one criteria, which makes a good, a good transition kernels. That's what you were just uh, talking about. So that going backwards and going forwards um, is symmetric or has the same probability to occur. And that's one way to ensure that you have, um, you're preserving the target distribution. Although you can also have something else, um, but then it requires longer proofs, I think. But the, the detailed balance is at least uh, the easy way to go, I think. Okay, I'm not sure whether I understand you correctly since. Uh, going forward is is another is the the, in, uh, the probability is the inverse of going backwards, so it's not this one that not be the same probability. Uh, since our, our alpha value is different, whether we go from A to B or from B to A. Um. But the proposal is. Symmetric, right? Ah, okay, okay. okay. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah. That's alpha value is your acceptance. I forget what this parameter was, sorry. Yes, it was pro probability of acceptance. Yes, yes, of course, this should depend yeah. on the underlying distribution. Otherwise, you're just randomly wandering. But okay, what I meant was about the probability to choose, uh, well, to, to suggest a, a given step, okay? Yes, exactly. The same. Okay, I see. This is the Thank same you. all around you. So you can kind of imagine this, right, with your Gaussian proposal. If you had a bunch of samples and you applied the Gaussian uh, proposal to all of them and they all made a transition, uh, you should end up with the same distribution. Okay, yes. Thank you. But yeah, the mathematical proof, I guess, yeah, then you just have to start with uh, the expression for one distribution apply that operation mathematically and verify that it gives you the same. Mm -hmm. Sorry that I can't give more. Okay, no, that, that's good. Thank you. Okay, I see also a question from Benedict. Uh, yeah, might be a bit of a naive one, but when you say DQ is largest than the tails, uh, to me at least DQ is always an infinitesimal, the small part of whatever parameter you're looking at, in this case, the volume of the of Q. But uh, so you mean the, the total volume that makes up the tails is largest or compared to uh, uh, the, the part where uh, pi of Q is, is non-negligible? What do you mean by DQ is largest in tails? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a very good point. I mean, yes, mathematically, DQ is an infinitesimal volume element. 
So I think that was maybe some sloppy uh, paraphrasing on my part. But yeah, if you think about the few being multidimensional, and then as I integrate out, um, so like the integral of dq will certainly be much larger in the tails than it will be over this small space where your uh, target distribution may be high. So. Okay, so it's the, the integral really, it's the volume right, we're right. talking about. <laughs> yeah, think about all of this uh, within the framework that we're integrating over. Of course, uh, yeah, then how these two things contribute to that integral is what's really important. But yeah, sorry if it's confusing. I'm not sure how else I can explain that. No, I, I think I follow now. Okay. Thanks. No, okay, thanks for pointing that out because I'm sure it's confusing for multiple people. Okay, and also Johannes? Um, yes, one thing that um, might, be, might be helpful to clarify a bit, but I'm not sure if it's easy to answer because it's, it's so basic that it's uh, like difficult again. Um, you were talking about kernels and uh, like, for example, a like Gaussian kernel and transition kernel. And uh, when I was learning this, I always had a hard time wrapping my head around what actually is a kernel because there's also 10 different contexts in which the word is used. So could you elaborate on that a bit maybe? Yeah, 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 very good point. Uh, I don't have an exhaustive definition of the word kernel in the English and mathematical languages, but yes, it's, it's often used in the context of Markov chain Monte Carlo, simply to describe the proposal density or distribution as I suppose, maybe in a similar sense to a convolution kernel. Um, I'm not exactly sure why this language is used. Uh, again, if Johannes has any anything to add there that would be useful. No, not really. It's the proposal distribution, the probability to go to another place, given that you are at some uh, state or some uh, location in your parameter space. Yeah, so I'd say that it always means that within this little field of Markov chain Monte Carlo, but certainly in, in other areas, it can have different meanings or similar meanings. So. Um, at least right. we will speak about it. That's we're talking about the transition. Density. All right. Um, Benedict, do you have another question or your hand still raised? Oh, uh, I have to put it down. <laughs> Sorry. That's all right. Just checking. All right. So then I would keep going because now the fun part is coming. Okay, so the basics of Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. So now that we understood where we want to spend our computational resources and effort, the next step is really to understand how we can do this with the information that we have in our typical problem. So my pen go. Here we go. Yeah, and again, the goal here is efficiency. We want to move through this distribution and get to that place where we can compute our expectation values with as few samples as possible. So I think it's nice to start with this intuitive idea. Okay, we can exploit information about the geometry of this typical set which we don't know everything about a priori, but we have some information. And then we can start to think about, okay, if we have an idea about this geometry, we can move through it in an efficient, non-diffusive way. So if we knew exactly what the vector field of the typical set was, we could just follow it like a ball rolling along a slope, very low, like a marble going down one of those fun marble slides. 
And this would be much more efficient than hopping around somewhat randomly. So that's the goal, great. How can we find this vector field using only information about our target density? What we do with Hamiltonian Monte Carlo is actually use the gradient of the density. This will give us a vector field, uh, but it will give us the vector field that points towards the mode, right? Uh, so we can compute the gradient of our target distribution and imagine that we're sitting in it like we're sitting in some potential, but this won't give us the vector field of the typical set. It will just give us the vector field of that target density. And so we can imagine this as a physical system, as this is what we're really doing with the Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, is using ideas from Hamiltonian dynamics, Hamiltonian mechanics. So the physical analogy is quite appropriate. So let's we can quickly imagine that, okay, our, our density has a mode uh, or a maximum that's kind of like the um, center of a gravitational field, like the Earth, for example. So we could imagine this vector field of our target density would just be all pointing in this direction like this. And then if we had like a ball or a satellite, probably more realistic to simulate our trajectory, if we held it far away from the Earth and we let it go and it followed this vector field, it would eventually just crash into the Earth, right? Which is what we're seeing here. So that's not great. We don't want to just go to the mode and stay there because we saw in our discussion before that this point is actually not where most of the volume is and therefore not where most of the contribution to our expectation is. But at the same time, we, uh, don't want to, we don't have information on the location of this typical set. We can imagine the typical set is between the mode, which is here, and the tails, which is here, of our target density. This was pi q. And uh, so, okay, how can we follow this red kind of blurred region here, which we think to be our typical set? This kind of three-dimensional ring in between the mode and the tails. That's where we want to spend most of the time. Uh, so here we've just got like a three-dimensional version of this previous plot that I was showing in a sense. So we can avoid just crashing into the mode in our physical analogy by giving our little satellite some momentum. Instead of just dropping it, we can kind of throw it in a certain direction. And that's what's going on here. Uh, but okay, at the same time, we can't give it too little momentum or too much momentum as it could equally just go flying off into infinite space and the tails of the distribution, which we're not interested in. So the solution here is to imagine that we give our satellite or test particle some momentum, but understanding how much to give it such that we end up in the right region. And so now if we return to our notation, we can imagine that we expand our parameter space. So we now have a dual space by introducing auxiliary momentum parameters. So for every Q, we now have a P. So you might think, oh no, we've now dramatically increased the complexity of our problem uh, and indeed the dimensionality. Uh, so we now have a target distribution over Q and P. And we can express this with this conditional relationship. So that we have every P is given, um, is conditional on a certain Q. So we'll have different Ps depending on where we are in Q uh, with some prior on Q, which is our original distribution. And the great thing about this uh, way of expanding is that we, 
we can always marginalize out the momentum. Like we don't really want the momentum in our solution. We just introduce it uh, to solve our problem of getting our satellite in the right orbit. So at the end of the day, it's always nice to remember that any trajectory or whatever we get up to in this joint space can always be marginalized out. So we can always integrate over P uh, and get back to our original target distribution of interest. So then continuing this physical analogy, we can bring in the Hamiltonian dynamics to actually construct trajectories in the joint space on P and Q. And so we can write the Hamiltonian of the system, which is uh, physically analogous to the total energy of the system as the log of our joint distribution on Q and P. And this we can actually expand using our above expression here into two different terms. We have the log of this conditional distribution for P given Q, and then we have the log of our target density that we started with. And these actually have also got physical analogies. Uh, this conditional part is analogous to the kinetic energy of the system. And this other part here is analogous to the potential energy of the system. So again, coming back to this picture before of the target distribution being kind of a potential well, uh, that's actually very true in the physical analogy of what we're doing here. And the kinetic energy being our choice of momentum given Q. Uh, so there's a lot of physical ways to picture this algorithm without actually getting into the uh, mathematics or differential geometry under the hood too much. So, okay, we have the information on the target distribution at any given point, just like we did with the metropolis method but we don't know the kinetic energy, right? That's what I was talking about before when I said, okay, we want to give some momentum, but not too much momentum. How do we choose the momentum given Q? So that's still something to be determined, but let's continue for now with the, the rest of the algorithm. Let's say we, we have a way to define the kinetic energy. Okay, so Benedict says what motivates the definition of Hamiltonian as minus. Okay, that's again, this is just coming back to how you would write it physically. Um, as it would be. Yes, I think I don't have a good example beyond that. <laughs> it's just continuing the, the physical analogy. In principle, it doesn't really matter. I suppose it's just about if you're if you're wanting to explore regions of large probability or small probability, and if you're defining an algorithm to find the minimum or a maximum, and then you would just reverse the signs depending on what you're doing. Uh, is that sufficient for now? <laughs> Thanks. Uh, at least. Don't worry about it too much. It's not so important for this discussion. All right. So this Hamiltonian that we defined contains the geometry of the typical set embedded in it. That information is in there now. And we can use it to find a vector field that's aligned with that typical set because of the conservative properties of the system. Uh, just in the same way as we can find the momentum we'd need to launch our satellite at to get it in a certain orbit using these conservation rules. So we have Hamilton's equations, which I've written here. 
And these just show how to evolve Q and P with time. So it's like we now release our ball in the system and we let it evolve. Uh, these equations will tell us that ball's trajectory in the joint space of P and Q. Uh, great, and we see here, dq dt is just equal to the kinetic, the gradient of the kinetic energy with respect to P. And then here, dp dt, it depends on uh, this factor, but also something that we will recognize to actually just be the gradient of our target distribution. So that's something important to realize here that we're using in Hamiltonian Monte Carlo to become more efficient uh, than the Metropolis algorithm. We now need to calculate the gradient of our target distribution. And this may be possible to do analytically, or it may not. Uh, this will depend on your problem. But for most packages that will implement Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, they will come with a numerical differentiation uh, packages that do that work for you. But it is important that that's an added complication here. And while it is an added complication in the end, the gains in efficiency are so great that it's worth doing if possible. It may not be possible for all problems to find the gradient. We need to have a continuous distribution that's differentiable. But yeah, again, this, this is satisfying our original physical intuition about the system. We can find that vector field that's aligned with the gradient, and it will help us understand the vector field aligned with the target set, uh, the typical set. So, okay, we evolve Hamilton's equations for some time and we generate trajectories in the joint space. And these trajectories will move very efficiently through that area of interest, the typical set. And then we can project these trajectories back down just into Q space so that we don't have these auxiliary momenta flying around anymore. And then that's actually, um, giving us what we set out to find. We now have a way to focus all our computational resources on exploring and characterizing something from the typical set. Great, so I'll just quickly summarize here in a few points, the Hamiltonian Markov transition uh, and how we have this, um, what this looks like compared to the transition or algorithm that you just implemented. Uh, we won't be implementing a Hamiltonian Monte Carlo algorithm because I think uh, you're welcome to try. I think it's a very nice educational exercise that probably takes a little bit longer than the Metropolis algorithm. And in practice, I'd always recommend that you use some uh, package that's been heavily debugged. As you'll see, there are many ways uh, we'll talk about it a little bit next, that things can go wrong. <laughs> okay, so we start with our uh, same information, the log likelihood and the prior that we've been working with before. And um, we start at a certain point in our parameter space. The first thing we do is we take this point into the joint space by sampling a momentum. And we'll come back on how we decide to define this conditional distribution. But we do that. So now we have a Q and a P that goes with that Q. We then evolve Hamilton's equations in the joint space for some time and move around the typical set. Uh, once we have, we've done this, we project back down to our usual that was that step, our usual parameter space through marginalization. And then we end up with a new point in our space. And this is the general idea uh, of the algorithm. So I think, let me just quickly see if I want to.
Okay, so I can quickly show a little visual demonstration uh, to help reinforce this. Let me just move to Okay, so now you should be seeing a different screen. Uh, there's this really nice open source um, application that I link to in the notebook uh, by Kai Fei. And I'm going to use this to just quickly demonstrate the very basic Hamiltonian of color. So here we have some target distribution similar to the banana that you've been working with. And here we see the contours of that density and also the marginals. So if we imagine that we're going to step in this space, we first choose a point and we give it a momentum that's here symbolized by this arrow. Uh, then with this momentum, we might make a trajectory up here, and then we'd move to that trajectory. And we continue to do so. And here the trajectory has been um, marginalized and projected down onto the target space. So it's kind of gone off a bit there. Let me autoplay it and close this so you can just see it go for a moment. So what we see here is that this way of moving around is pretty efficient. We're going from like way over here to way over here in just one step uh, and kind of flying around this space. Whereas if we would compare this, so I can maybe speed it up a little bit with like the random walk Metropolis Hastings that you were doing before, depending on the size, like here it's a very well chosen uh, proposal distribution because it's similar in size and dimension to the uh, underlying target distribution. But then, okay, of course, if we make this smaller, we can get kind of stuck in one place. We still haven't been out here yet. And if we make it too big, it's no longer really efficient either. So hopefully with that, I can, I can really encourage uh, you to try this application yourself. And, uh, have a play around also with the different parameters. Maybe I come back to it in a moment when I explain a few more details. But again, I would just like to stop here for a moment and see if there's any more questions. Okay, then I'll share again the notebook. Ah, oh, something in the chat. Hang on a sec, I gotta open it again. Yes, how do we choose the duration of the integration? That's a very good question. Um, the next part I'm going to talk about is all about these things we swept under the rug a bit, like the kinetic energy, the integration, um, and how we actually implement these in practice. So if you wouldn't mind uh, waiting, and then if there's still questions on this, we can address that later. Okay. All right, so as I was just saying, oh wait, I'll just put the participants back, yeah. We have two main quantities to be determined here uh, that are both very important for the algorithm to do anything useful. Uh, so we have the kinetic energy, which is our choice of momentum, and also the integration time, which is the length of these trajectories that we implement. 
And so these are the tuning parameters of the algorithm in a similar way to the tuning parameter of your metropolis algorithm was the proposal width. So in order for this algorithm to be useful to us, we need to find ways that we can optimize and choose these values for generic problems. So let's start with the kinetic energy, this choice of momentum. Each time we sample a new momentum, we're entering a different energy level of the system in the physical analogy. So in order to move around efficiently, we want to explore different energy levels in a uniform way. And we also want our momentum sampling to imply energy sampling that is close to that of the marginal energy distribution of the system. So I'll explain what we mean by that. When we choose a momentum, we implicitly choose an energy. And we actually have for our target distribution, if we would marginalize out Q here, a marginal energy distribution. And we want to choose our kinetic energy such, or our proposals for the kinetic energy, such that we are um, efficient, uh, so we are essentially sampling from this distribution. And we can connect back here to what we heard about in Johannes's lecture before, when you were considering uh, important sampling, and there the optimally uh, the optimal choice of proposal distribution is that of the underlying distribution, right? Because then uh, you're always sampling as optimally as possible. So that's basically what we're doing here. And um, okay. With that goal in mind, uh, of course, we don't, again, know what this distribution is a priori. Uh, and there's actually an infinite possible choice of kinetic energy distributions, right? This could be anything you want it to be. Uh, but let's restrict our search to uh, standard and easy cases to work with. Uh, there's a lot of interesting research done on extending this, but I won't go into that here. In practice, what we normally work with are Euclidean Gaussian kinetic energies, and this simply means uh, a Gaussian or a normal distribution centered at zero with some variance uh, that we'll call M here. Because of the physical analogy, this M is often referred to as the mass matrix, and that can be something, there's a lot of uh, lingo around Hamiltonian Monte Carlo that can make the literature quite difficult to understand if you come into it as a newcomer. So the mass matrix is really just the variance of this proposal momentum distribution. And because of the dual behavior between P and Q, the momentum and parameters, we can actually define an optimal choice for M within this assumption of Euclidean Gaussian kinetic energy. Uh, I won't go into the proof for that. You can find it in Bettencourt's paper that I linked to. Uh, but what the result is, is we can choose M by setting its inverse equal to the target covariance of it. And this is great because we can estimate these target covariances during a warm up phase, much similar to the burn in phase that you have with the Metropolis algorithm. We can kind of get our chains going. And then when we have a good enough uh, convergence to estimate these covariances, we can change the mass matrix, and then we can iterate through that process. Uh, of course, doing so is somewhat of an art, and a good implementation uh, should be able to adapt warm up to different problems effectively. Great. So now we have a way to choose the kinetic energy. Now, coming back to the question from Martin, we also need to optimize the integration time. So we can imagine going back to that visualization before, if we integrate for really short times, we won't really move very far. But if we integrate too far, then we'll actually end up coming back to regions we've already been to. And, you know, it's, we're just flying off. 
Uh, but of course, we're moving within the space of the typical set. So we should always at least be traveling around the typical set. Uh, the optimal choice of the integration time actually depends on the kinetic energy. So that's a nice complication. And also where in the joint space we are. We can imagine like certain regions of the parameter space may have more curvature and require smaller integration times to kind of get into the little nooks and crannies. Whereas other areas could be very smooth and broad and we just want to integrate over them and move around. So uh, these two things, the kinetic energy and where we are, are important. Uh, a practical solution to this that I also don't have time to go into, but I think is very interesting, is the no U-turn algorithm. And so what this actually implements is that the integration time or the length of the tra trajectory is chosen dynamically. So that's every time you move around, there's an algorithm on top of our Hamiltonian Monte Carlo algorithm that's deciding if it's the right time to stop or not. And so samplers implementing this criterion are often referred to as no U-turn samplers or colloquially nuts. So you might see this in the name or description of certain algorithms. Uh, but this really improves the efficiency, having this dynamically decided on the fly. So a few more words about, okay, implementing this in practice. Uh, I would quickly ask, if I answered your question there, Martin. Or if anyone has further questions at this point. Cool. Okay, so thanks for staying with me this far. <laughs> Uh, we're getting towards the end now, but okay, here we have to keep in mind everything we've talked about sounds good, but how do we actually code this up if you guys were going to sit down now and implement this algorithm? We have to solve Hamilton's equations numerically, and this is really important because whenever you do some kind of differential equation solver numerically or integration, there's always going to be some uncertainty associated with it or some inaccuracy. And typically these inaccuracies actually add with integration time and scale with the number of dimensions, which is not great because we uh, often choose Hamiltonian and Monte Carlo to escape the problem of high dimensions. So, the geometry of this problem motivates a choice of integrator called symplectic integrators, uh, which are great because the errors at least oscillate around the true values. They don't just add the longer that we integrate. And that's all I'm going to say about them for now. Another aspect of their performance, uh, which actually becomes very interesting in the implementation of Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, is that in regions of extreme curvature or difficult geometry, the numerical trajectories actually diverge to infinity. So you might think, okay, that's, that's not great. Uh, I don't want my integrator to diverge to infinity when I'm trying to compute or evolve my trajectories. But as it turns out, these transitions or when this happens is actually a really helpful diagnostic for finding problems in your model implementation or in your chains. So it actually ends up being a blessing in disguise. So I'll come back to that. But uh, another thing we can do to correct, because okay, we we have errors or inaccuracies that oscillate around the true value, but there's still some inaccuracy. And this whole algorithm is built on this foundation. And so if we have inaccuracies, we're no longer in this conservative system of dynamics that is needed to get where we want to be. Uh, but there's a way to perfectly correct for this. 
uh, by defining a reversible transition, because the transitions I talked about so far aren't actually reversible, right? You have a positive momentum and you move forward. Uh, so we can introduce a reversibleness to that transition by having both uh, positive and negative momentum evolution. So you can imagine for every point, you now have two trajectories that go on. And we can then introduce on top of this, a metropolis except, uh, except reject step, just like you had in your implementations of the metropolis algorithm. And so uh, the required or target acceptance probability that we would need to correct for our errors in this reversible way, so by making this reversible, it comes back to the discussion we had before about how do we have a kernel or proposal density that preserves our target distribution. Um, yes, and in doing this, we actually can calculate the acceptance probability that we need from the Hamiltonian. Again, some detail that I don't have time to go into, but it's possible. So as we integrate numerically, um, the integration time is actually not really a time anymore. It becomes a step size and a number of steps. The step size can be optimized during the warm-up phase. So that's actually connected to very much this target acceptance. And the number of steps, like I said before, the length of the trajectory is what is optimized by the dynamic no U-turn criterion. So that's done on the fly. But in the warm-up, we optimize for the kinetic energies and the mass matrix that I talked about before, and also the step size. So those two things are done in the warm-up phase. So uh, example implementation of this is in STAN. Uh, STAN is a package implemented in C++ uh, with a very robust implementation of an adaptive HMC algorithm, including the snow U-turn sampling. So everything I've talked about and more. Uh, what you do is you specify your model and data, and STAN will optimize the mass matrix and the step size in the warm-up, letting you focus on the other part. So this is what we'll be working with in the second block of the course. And uh, we'll see how to use and interact with SAN in a lot more detail then. Um, okay, so I think some final words from me before we take another break uh, are now the diagnostics. So, we will work with uh, Stan or Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, much like you have been working with your algorithm for the Metropolis case, in that you always want to verify that your chains are useful and that they converge uh, and aren't doing anything strange. And so just like there, great diagnostics for this are the effective sample size that you've been working with already, and also the R-hat, or also called the gelman rubin statistic, to judge within chain correlation, convergence of chains, and so on. But the algorithm for HMC, as we have implemented, actually gives us two new diagnostic tools that do different things to this um, effective sample size and gelman rubin statistic. So what we now have are the divergent transitions that I mentioned before. So like I said, in regions of high curvature, the results of integrating this trajectory will diverge. And so the sampler flags this and then continues before um, with a different uh, proposal. So what we can get out at the end of our sampling is a chain where we have flagged that certain samples in the chain 
were coming from divergent transitions or were associated with divergent transitions. And so this can be used, we can plot these uh, and actually visualize where in our parameter space are these regions occurring? Uh, and like, is our model perhaps parameterized in a strange way that there's funnels appearing or difficult regions to sample from? And it's really important to take note of divergent transitions because if they are present, even in very small numbers in your chains, this means that we cannot rely on these chains for our inference. So it's an algorithm that can fail, and when it does fail, it warns you about it. So this is always useful, as opposed to an algorithm that just continues uh, blindly, even though it's failing and doesn't tell you. Uh, another one, the nicely named EBFMI, which means the energy Bayesian fraction of missing information, somewhat of a mouthful. Uh, this just quantifies the mismatch before in the terms of our kinetic energy choice or our proposal for momentum or energies and the target distribution, the ideal optimal case uh, for this. So this allows us to diagnose poorly chosen kinetic energies. So it can tell us when that part of the warm-up phase has gone wrong and something's not working. And there's just like our hat, you have a kind of ballpark. If this is below 0.3, it means that these two distributions just are very much mis mismatched. So uh, I've been talking for about an hour now, so I'd like to pause again and stop and also check in with Johannes, his plans for this afternoon. Uh, I do have a little coding demonstration I could do to show these diagnostics in action, but you can also check it out on your own. Everything is in the notebook that you should need. All right, so any questions, first of all? Okay, uh, Johannes, go ahead. Uh, so two things. Um, firstly, I think it's not entirely clear what exactly happens in this warm up phase. Yeah. I mean, obviously, like the parameters are estimated, but what is, it, what, what is the algorithm actually doing there? And the second thing is, I do not understand the EBFMI um, or what this value of 0 0.3 actually tells me like it quantifies the mismatch but in, in what way yes it mean it's equal to 0.3 okay very nice questions uh so first of all i can say a few words about the warm-up uh the optimal or i don't know best warm-up recipe is still a very much open topic of research uh, but in practice, what's usually done is to start with some, just like a standard MCMC, with some sample from the priors in parameter space as a starting point. Uh, and then you have a starting choice of the mass matrix. Uh, and so, like I said, the two main things that are getting attention in the warm up. Of the mass matrix and the step size. So we start with, let's say, standard choices for these uh, that may be slightly adapted uh, based on the uh, dimensions of your problem. And then what happens is you implement the algorithm with these starting points and you usually optimize one at a time. So let's say we start um, with a given step size. We run our chain for enough iterations 
uh, that it satisfies some basic criteria. And then we make an estimate of the target covariances. And when we have this estimate, we can update our uh, mass matrix and we can instead try out different step sizes and see how, um, how we move around with these different step sizes. Uh, like I mentioned before, the step sizes are chosen to result in a certain except for metropolis steps. There's like many moving parts here. Uh, we typically choose for Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, given that our metropolis step is defined in quite a different way to give us error correction on the integration of trajectories. We choose a number like 0.8 is the standard target acceptance rate. And so we'll play around with the step size and the warm up to try and get an acceptance rate of 0.8. And so this you can check numerically. And then once you've got a nice step size, you'll go back to letting um, estimating target covariances, updating the mass matrix, and iterating through this process. Obviously, it would get better and better the longer you run it, but you don't want a massively long and complicated warm up to uh, offset the gains you would get here by the algorithm itself being more efficient in the end. So that's the game you have to play, okay? I want to make use of every warm up iteration as well as possible. Uh, and then exactly how to do this is a bit more of an art than a well defined. How was that for the first part? <laughs> Definitely exhaustive. Yeah, um, <laughs> there's no yeah. simple way, I'm afraid. Yeah, sure, sure. No, uh, I, I think uh, a bit clearer now what happens. If people are interested, there's uh, you can check out on the Stan website. There's a description of exactly the warm up procedure that they are using. Um, but yeah, I think it's, I won't go into it here in more detail. But the second part you are asking about is the EBFMI. What is this? So yeah, this is another tricky part. Um, I can try and draw something to at least help. Uh, so I, I said before that the ideal choice of kinetic energy should match the marginal energy distribution of our target function. Uh, this is just, uh, if I would uh, marginalize out over the parameters. So we have an ideal choice. And the motivation for this, I hope, is at least conceptually clear in that we want, uh, in a similar way to what we were doing with important sampling, the optimal choice is going to be the target distribution itself. And here we want to choose momenta and energies in a similar way, efficiently. Otherwise, the algorithm, again, falls apart. <laughs> so uh, then let's say we're estimating, in the end, our choice of the kinetic energy based on this Euclidean Gaussian assumption. So we just have a Gaussian with a mean of 0 and a variance defined by the mass matrix. So we're just estimating the width of our Gaussian, basically. It's a very simplified way to think about it. We can imagine that if we have a distribution like this, or equivalently, a distribution like this, there's another. I mean, we can see visually that this is a mismatch, OK? So a way to quantify this uh, is the what's called the Bayesian fraction of missing information, which is just a way to quantify, generic way that you can use, to quantify the difference in two distributions, shapes. And I forget exactly the definition of this, uh, but I think you're essentially, uh, I don't know, 
integrating some part of the distribution that's not covered by another one or something like that. And the choice of 0.3 is again somewhat arbitrary, like our hat. It's just in practice, this seems to be good enough. Uh, did that answer your question somewhat? So it's essentially like more or less the area under one curve that is not under the other one or something like this. Yes, but if, if it's small, that it's uh, bad. So I think it's the maybe the inverse of that or one like that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, yes. So in practice, I you know one doesn't need to worry too much about all these little details, but it's important to understand. Okay, what are they? What are these signals telling you? So if you remember nothing else, just think. Okay. Divergent transition means there's like weird geometry in my space. Sampler is getting stuck in some curvature. And low EB EBFMI means that the warm up was not able to find the good kinetic energy for your model. And so something went wrong there. Great, thanks. All right, uh, wait a little more. Does any more questions? Okay. Um, uh, sorry, I have a quick question. Go ahead. I hope my microphone isn't too bad. Um, so I'm wondering a little bit also about the EBFMI. Uh, what exactly is the kinetic energy conditioned on Q? Because I thought we would just randomly sample the uh, and the, the momentum depending not really on the position, but only on, on this nice on, on this mass matrix thing. So how does it depend on Q then? Yeah, yeah, sure. So um, good question. Let me think. So I think the short answer is no, it doesn't depend on Q. Here we optimize the mass matrix globally so that everywhere in your parameter space, the proposal will be the same. And that's fixed during the warmer. And we are aiming for it to be this distribution that we motivate as optimal. It is possible to define uh, this distribution as Q dependent by choosing a different kinetic energy, i.e. not Euclidean Gaussian. Uh, and that's also a very interesting research direction. Uh, but yes, in principle, this particular choice is not Q dependent. But in so general, Sorry, go ahead. No, go, go ahead, please. In general, one could have Q dependence. Uh, Q dependence sounds a little bit like, is, is this a, then this would be like Romanian money for Monte Carlo, right? Yeah, okay, so you're already an expert. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. About <laughs> Romanian Monte Carlo is indeed uh, one choice of, a different choice of kinetic energies. In particular, I think called Romanian Gaussian metric, which is why Romanian font color. Uh, so yeah. if it the... Sorry. No, <laughs> no, no. Please talk. I'm always talking too much. So in the e, EBFMI case, is this then the Q momenta after integration or? What exactly is this, is this referring to? Or is this only applicable if the mass matrix, if the uh, mass matrix is Q dependent? No, no, it's it's not only applicable then. 
because it's okay ignoring q uh it's just characterizing the difference in let's say shape of this proposal distribution for momentum okay the mass matrix can still have different scales in different dimensions uh to mm -hmm. that of the optimal one ah okay now i get it okay all right which okay. i'm trying to show with this conceptual plot here but it really it's yeah it's difficult to visualize Okay, so phi of E would be kind of the, with the inverse covariance thing. Yeah, uh, yes, that's the optimal case. If we've yeah. estimated our target covariance is perfect. Yeah. All right. Thank and you. I also would invite you to check out Bettencourt's paper if you haven't already. That's a little bit more detail, but not a lot uh, there. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I never read it from yeah. end, but I guess I have to. <laughs> no, no, but uh, in that case, there's also much more mathematical paper from Bettencourt called, um, I think it's the Foundations of Hamiltonian Monte Carlo or the Geometric Foundations that's worth looking at for that. I will do that. Thank you. I maybe refer to it. Uh, maybe not, yeah. Okay. Uh, time is going on. So, Johannes, I would like to ask you your plans for this afternoon, <laughs> if you would like to take over now. No, I think it's fine. Um, please show the example or whatever you wanted to do. Okay, thanks. So then I will move. Uh, maybe quickly, since I'm now back on the computer, uh, I can show this visualization again to give a little bit of intuition. Okay, so here we were running the random walk and I showed you before this Hamiltonian NC, which is kind of the basic implementation. You can also check out like the efficient nuts, uh, which implements a little bit more of what I talked about just to show that the complexity and what it's doing. So, okay, now again, you introduce some momentum direction you evolve a trajectory and you accept or reject and you actually sample for the no-Newton criteria, you pick different points on this trajectory, and that's a clever way of doing that. And then you go again, and you can see also there's this reverse and um, forward and backward nature to the transition. So can just let it play. And this combination means that you have really efficient uh, movement throughout this space. That's probably the closest option here in this nice list that you can check out to what I was talking about at the end there and to what's implemented in Stan. Oh, yeah, thanks, Johannes. Uh, this is the link to the demo also in the chat now. So if you get bored listening to me, you can instead play with this. <laughs> but yeah, I will uh, now move to the uh, little demo I wanted to show. So that's where we were before. And uh, yes, let's see. So here I'm going to implement uh, a textbook problem that's often used for this kind of stuff um, called the eight schools problem in STAM and talk about how these new diagnostics that I introduced can be helpful uh, in an actual example. Uh, let me just get the, these windows back in the chat. Yeah. Okay, that'll do. So, um, 
the whole, I'll just quickly describe the problem. Uh, it's a kind of social sciences example from this textbook by Gelman, uh, which I think is, we've already had recommended by Johannes as some nice further reading for this course. And the idea is we want to understand if, um, if extra coaching for students can improve their grades or not. Uh, so are these coaching programs effective? And the experiment is conducted in eight schools and each time it's tried to be implemented in the same way. And the results that we get out are for each school, we have some estimated impact. Uh, so this will be done by some standard procedure. And this estimate will come with a standard error. Uh, so this impact Y and estimate sigma for each school. So we want to consider the data from all the schools in our conclusion. And we think the schools and the programs are similar, but of course they're not identical. There might be some uh, heterogeneity there. So to capture this, we're going to use something called a hierarchical normal model. Um, we'll talk more about hierarchical models in the next week. But basically, I'll describe it very briefly here. We can introduce some higher level parameters, mu and tau, to describe the average impact over all schools and its variance. Uh, each school has a true impact, let's call it theta. Uh, which we don't know exactly what it is, and an observed impact, yj, with some uncertainty, sigma j. So our model has two levels, which is why it has this hierarchical name. At the first level, we have a um, conditional connection between theta j and the high level parameters, mu and tau. And this is just a normal distribution with mean, mu, and variance tau. And uh, at this level, so we can think of, yeah, these theta j are just eight different samples from this normal distribution with mean mu and variance tau. And then down here on the lower level, the actual observations, yj, are again a sample from a normal distribution, but this distribution is uh, dependent on uh, the mean value, the true effect, theta, and this uncertainty that's given to us, uh, sigma. So this level is described by two normal distributions. Uh, we can write this in STAN. Don't worry too much here about the syntax and the interface with STAN. I'll cover this in an introductory session next week. I just want to use this for the demonstration. Uh, we can write this model uh, in a separate file called schools.stan using the stan model syntax where we just put in our data parameters and model into three different blocks. So, okay, you'll recognize here we have J schools, each has a Y and sigma. And sigma must be greater than zero, as must the number of schools. Uh, we have three kind of high level parameters, mu, tau, and theta, which is a vector of length j. And then our model, like I said, is basically two normal distributions. We can use this twiddle notation that's common when you're writing distributions out. So we just say theta is distributed according to a normal and y is also distributed according to a norm. And the vectorization is done in this notation. Uh, there's also some priors here on these high level parameters. So right up here, there's a prior and also here. But OK, let's not worry too much about that now. So we can, with this model, uh, compile this stand code. Like I said, it's this is a basically an interface which gets compiled down to C++ code uh, by Stan. 
that takes a few seconds, but it's a one-time cost. And then we can use Python to pass our data into this model. So if this is our data, we see that, okay, the estimated effect in some schools is positive, quite high, and sometimes it's a little bit negative. So it's not conclusive that it's always a good thing to be coaching kids, or is it doing anything useful? Uh, and then we have some, you know, the error on this is quite high, you know, just a quite uncertain estimate. Uh, so we can pass this in. The important thing when we define our data input to STAN is just to use the same variable names as we do in the STAN program. So it knows where to put things and obviously the same uh, kinds of inputs like ints or reals or uh, arrays or vectors and so on. Uh, so then we can fit the model uh, that we defined by inputting the data defining uh, how many sampling iterations we want. So this would be post format that we talked about and how many chains. Uh, so you can run Hamiltonian Monte Carlo independently on different chains, just like the Metropolis algorithm. And a random seed if we want to make it reproducible. Uh, so that runs. Okay, and now there's some useful functions. Uh, you should see that it's quite fast to sample uh, 4,000 iterations. Uh, yes, we can use these functions to kind of run diagnostics on our fit and also get a summary of its outputs. So I'll do that again here. And what we see uh, is a bunch of checks are performed. I didn't talk about the tree depth. Uh, this is associated with the no U-turn sampling implementation, which I didn't have time to go into, but that's all that is. Anyway, it says it's fine here. Uh, we have divergent transitions, although not so many, like 2% of our transitions are ending with divergence. So you might be tempted to think like, ah, oh, it's not such a problem, but as soon as we have one divergent transition, it means something's off in the chain. So you've got to dig deeper. And we're also seeing the EBFMI is 0.25, which it's happily telling us is below the threshold of 0.3, which means there's some trouble. Uh, however, our usual diagnostics that you were working with before are actually fine. So it, I chose this example because it highlights a particular problem where you might not find it if you didn't look with these diagnostics. So um, you'll see also that in this, uh, Stan gives you some, what it hopes to be helpful message about what you can do. So here, yes, these diversion transitions indicate we're not able to fully explore the posterior. And it says, try increasing adapt delta closer to one. Okay, so what does this mean? Um, adapt delta is the stand uh, language or notation for the target acceptance rate of the metropolis. So if we increase this from its standard value of 0.8, closer and closer to one, it means that we always want to accept um, our uh, metropolis step, uh, this will force a smaller step size. So this is not terrible advice. It means, okay, the integrator is, is getting stuck in this particular neighborhood. And so if you force um, the step size to be smaller, maybe it will be able to move around better there. Uh, but if you make a smaller step size, your algorithm is less efficient because now you need more evaluations to go the same distance in your transition uh, trajectory. So that's some trade-off that you may be willing to make and something you can try. But then if this doesn't work, try to reparameterize the model. Okay, this is the quite general advice and not always helpful, but uh, unfortunately then it means uh, the space you're trying to sample in is, is really odd and you should try to do something about that with parameterization. Okay, and then here's the summary. 
uh, of all the different parameters that we had free. So we had a mu and a tau and then eight different thetas uh, just provided with some kind of standard uh, information. So we see, okay, the effective sample size is a little bit lower for some given that we have 4,000 uh, iterations, but the R hat is, is very good. And in any case, things are acceptable in terms of those diagnostics. Okay, so we noted the divergent transitions and the low EVM FI. So now I want to show how you can use these divergences to uh, find out where the problem is. So I'm going to make a pair plot of my chains. Uh, here I'm using this RVIS library that you can check out. And I'm just telling it, okay, don't plot all the theta because then we will have tiny little individual plots um, and too many of them, but just plot one of them. So we just plot one J coordinate and also plot uh, mu and how for me. So we can study that. And we can imagine that, okay, you can have a look if you want, if you change this to other values, you see a pretty similar story in different uh, theta. So this is kind of the interesting projection for this problem, but in general, you'd have to hunt around a bit and find a nice way to visualize your problem using what you know about the parameters and what you think might be going wrong. So we can already see these divergent transitions, which I've highlighted in red, are all clustered in a particular area. So in particular, at very small tau values, so as tau is approaching zero because tau is the variance of our parents' distribution for the total effect, mu and tau with the parameters of that normal. And uh, obviously tau is uh, a variance standard deviation. It can't be less than zero, but it can be small. And in this neighborhood, the sampler seems to be having problems. So this signifies to us that there's maybe some funnel shape here, as we go to small tau values, the sampler isn't able to explore. Um, so yeah, this particular visualization is quite a um, common thing that you might see in this kind of model indication of a funnel geometry. This is actually a very well known problem for this kind of model. And we can be parameterized with a non-centered parameterization, this so-called centered connection between normal distributions leads to the funnel shape that we see. So this parameter, yeah, I, I include a link if you want to um, have a closer look. Here in the Stan Units Guide, they cover some common issues and reparameterization. So uh, you can read more about it there. But for now, I will just hand you the reparameterization solution. And what we can do is we can move our, um, introduce a, a theta prime and shift it so that theta is now equal to mu plus tau, theta primed, and have a distribution on theta primed that is just the standard normal distribution. And you can see these two parameterizations, um, this one here and the one above, are completely equivalent in terms of what they describe, uh, but it's just how the sampler sees the model. And so I've implemented this for you here. Have a little look at the code, what's different. Instead of theta, we have theta prime here. And then we have this transformed parameters block where we introduce theta and it depends on these other parameters that we've introduced, hence transformed parameters. So we now have theta defined uh, indirectly via theta prime, mu, and tau. And then in this part of the model, we no longer have a 
connection to theta, but we tell Stan that theta prime is distributed according to the standard law. Okay. So we can try to fit this model instead. That's just compiling. And then um, we can rerun these diagnostics and we'll see this time that those two problems have been solved. And we might also note that we have much more efficient sampling. So this NF here before was only kind of in the hundreds, uh, although better for some parameters, worse for others. And now we see it's um, relatively high across the board. So I uh, can also visualize. We now see there are no divergent transitions and that this region here, uh, if we were to uh, zoom in better, we'd see that there's a much uh, deeper exploration towards small tau value. And then here, we can see, uh, again, list of further reading. I already introduced a couple of these. Uh, this is the main paper, the conceptual introduction. Uh, a more mathematical option I mentioned briefly earlier, this geometric foundations information on the no U-turn criterion. Um, and there's also the STAN website for this particular package and the eight schools problem summarized in uh, this section of Gelman et al. Okay, so I will, of course, invite you to, to play around with this. Uh, with this code here, you already have a basic uh, STAN implementation, one that's often used to introduce STAN, so you can try out different uh, chain lengths, different uh, data, and see how things change if you want to. But uh, we will see a lot more of it next week, so I won't go into more detail here. Let me know if there are questions. If not, we can finish. Okay, I'm scared that I lost you all, but you have also all next week to question me on similar topics. So don't worry if you don't know where to start. Uh, I'll hand over to Johannes now to wrap up. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. Um, very nice. Uh, let me just uh, say a few words to close up here, give me a few seconds. Okay, so let me share my screen. So um, we started out, yeah, I, want to just remind you where we are at the moment. Um, so we, we talked initially about uh, modeling a little bit, priors and likelihoods. Um, we talked yesterday about important sampling. Today was all about uh, MCMC. And we already saw uh, a simple important sampling algorithm and a simple MCMC algorithm. And Today in the afternoon, Francesca gave us an introduction to a more advanced NCMC algorithm. And tomorrow in the morning, we will talk about another uh, algorithm called nested sampling. Um, whichever of those you apply to your model, the point is to get these posterior samples out of it. 
and um, something uh, Francesca was pointing out, for the HMC, we also need not just the prior and likelihood, so the posterior density, but you also need gradients on that. And these two methods can then also compute the integral, Z, or evidence, <clears throat> while MCMC just works on posterior samples. And uh, tomorrow I will talk about simple nested sampling, so similar to the morning session today. And then in the afternoon, what I want to do is talk a little bit about the advanced uh, versions of nested sampling and very briefly about important sampling as well and research that is going on in these fields. And I will also talk a little bit about MCMC algorithms um, that do not use gradients that are not as good as uh, Hamiltonian MC, um, but that are quite popular and some aspects that you might be aware, might want to be aware of, some limitations of those, and when you can use them and when it's not so interesting. Uh, so you've seen we were working on MCMC with the random walk and with HMC now. We mostly talked about how to update from one point to the next point. So most of the time we talked about how to run this chain forward, for example. Um, we spent relatively little time on how do we start this whole process. Although Francesca was telling us how it, it works in Stan, you sample from the entire uh, prior. Um, and, and how we terminate this whole process. But if you want to have a complete uh, software package or a complete uh, implementation, you also need to think about uh, these parts. When do you stop and how do you start? And um, another uh, issue is some numerical issues that you might run into. So we heard about the gradients and uh, that they're quite sensitive to this. Um, and you have other problems uh, when you run, when you actually try to do math with floating point numbers. So that's something you want to be aware of. Uh, how to diagnose when your method goes wrong. So what, what views do you have into your software package that something is, is, is uh, wrong or that your algorithm uh, is recognizing that it's not doing what it's supposed to do. So some common difficult target distributions or aspects of target distributions that you uh, might encounter is, and one is one we've already dealt with. You might have very peculiar shapes like bananas or funnels that we just heard about that are difficult to navigate uh, with the algorithm. You might have multiple modes then the question is, how do you go from one to the other? How do you deal with this? Which algorithms can deal with those and which cannot deal so well? You might have many parameters that you want to vary, so just high dimensionality aspect. And you might have problems where your data are very, very good and very informative. So your posterior is a very tiny part of your prior. So it's very concentrated and you might need a lot of time to actually find this region of your parameter space. And so when you are thinking about which algorithm you want to apply to your problem, um, these are things you might to want to think about and of course also want to try out. Um, it's always good to try a couple of algorithms and see if they work for your problem. And this is actually um, the idea of the homework exercise, of the big homework exercise that I briefly want to mention, if there's enough time. Yes, it should be okay. So in this, uh, the idea of the big homework, which has 200 points, is that you choose your own inference problem, which might have six or 20 or however many parameters, but not just two, some substantial number of parameters. 
And you can bring your own, or you use this uh, LIGO gravitational wave example that is, that is in this notebook, notebook nine. You can also work with this if you don't want to apply it to your own problem. And the idea is that you try uh, several of these uh, techniques, important sampling, MCMC, nested sampling, and, uh, and, and test how well they work. And the idea is also that you use not just something very simple, but uh, get to know some more advanced methods. Uh, so next week will all, all be about STAN. Uh, tomorrow I will introduce nested sampling and some more advanced nested sampling codes like these ones that you could use here. And these are um, some other MCMC packages that I will talk about tomorrow and, uh, and they don't use gradients and are quite popular, but of course they also have limitations. So the idea here is that you try to, at least two, and you compare how they perform, do their work, what do you notice, how, how efficient are they, how many effective number of samples do you get in an hour, let's say, and what are the tuning parameters, what happens if you fiddle with those a little bit. So that's the idea. Here is uh, an analysis of um, a gravitational wave event, this one in particular, um, that was the collision of two uh, neutron stars, binary neutron merger event, and you're working here with the real data. And it's a very nice package that allows you to analyze it. So that's, that's one option for, for this homework. Johannes, one, yes. one comment here that uh, I have two likelihoods, particle physics related. So I think people interested in doing that um, my mail you or me and uh, do generation inferring uh, problem on, on, on kind of problem relevant for particle physics. Okay. Good. Yeah, and you're welcome to use any problem you find interesting. And there are some hints here uh, how to how to get started with nested sampling and MCMC for for this one. Okay, um, then don't forget if you haven't yet in the MCMC notebook notebook three. Uh, at the bottom here is another ticket to leave. So uh, it's again very short, just three questions. Um, please fill that out so I know how you what you learned and what you found interesting and what you were confused about. And here are a bunch of links as well. Um, if you're interested in exploring a bit more about MCMC. Okay, with this, um, I would say see you tomorrow. And otherwise, uh, stay on if you have any more questions. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. You're stopping recording and putting it on the...